We have one of the very best philosophy departments in the whole world here at Notre Dame. When I was a PhD student, I wouldn't have even dared to dream to get a job at a department this good. Ethics is so big. This is where my deepest calling is because philosophy is so important to the Catholic tradition. How do you philosophize? Ideas can shape the cultures and the times in which we live, for better or for worse. Sometimes you can do everything right and at the drop of a hat, the world can change. You've got to take time and space to think. Oh, absolutely. And the Catholic voice was incredibly important in that period. I mean, Father Ted has become a real hero of mine. He took Notre Dame and put us on the front lines. This man was a visionary. From the campus of Our Lady's University, this is For Good, Stories from Notre Dame, a behind the scenes glimpse into life under the Golden Dome and the powerful stories that drive Notre Dame to become a force for good in the world. Hello and welcome to For Good, Stories from Notre Dame. Today, I'm joined by Megan Sullivan, the Wilsey Family Collegiate Professor of Philosophy, also the director of the Notre Dame Institute for Advanced Study and of the new director of the new Notre Dame Ethics Initiative. We're coming to you from the office of Father Ted Hesburgh on the 13th floor of the Hesburgh Library, one of the most historic and unique sacred spots on campus and the perfect venue for a conversation on the central role of ethics and the fabric of the University of Notre Dame. So I'm thrilled today to welcome Professor Megan Sullivan. Thanks for being with us, Megan. Tell us a little bit first about yourself, a little about your background, uh, both personal and, and then some of your your professional uh, preparation to come to the to Notre Dame. Thanks, Lou. It's exciting to be here. This is definitely a sacred space for me, and I hope we you get a chance to get into that a little bit. So I'm a philosophy professor. I actually did not go to Notre Dame as an undergraduate. My students are always shocked to find that out. <laughs> um, I went to the University of Virginia. I'm from North Carolina originally, um, and went to UVA, then spent some time at Oxford, then spent some time at Rutgers. And when I was finishing up my my PhD in philosophy, I was starting to think about next steps in my career. Getting a job in the Notre Dame philosophy department is not something that you would ever have the arrogance to want coming out of grad school. We have one of the very best philosophy departments in the whole world here at Notre Dame. So when I was it's also getting one ready, of the largest, right? Second largest in North America, wow. second only to the University of Toronto. Wow. And also just historically a powerhouse because philosophy is so important to the Catholic tradition. Right. Notre Dame has always made big investments in philosophy. So when I was a PhD student, I wouldn't have even dared to dream to get a job at a department this good. I think I was bracing myself to um, to move off to Singapore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the year before I finished my doctorate, I came to Notre Dame for a conference uh, there was a big conference in philosophy of religion and my PhD advisor brought five of us graduate students out and he's like, I just want you guys to see how it's done out here. Mm. And I remember we were here in May. It was absolutely beautiful. Five day conference. I, I had the time of my life. I met a bunch of people in the department. Yeah. I remember sitting out in front of the Basilica after mass on the Sunday we were getting ready to leave and thinking, well, I'm glad I got to experience this before, you know, my career in philosophy gets thrown mm. to the wind. And I made some really good connections when I was here that summer. And so the next fall, when it was time to start putting together all my job applications to try to become a professor, the department here reached out to me and they said, you know, we loved getting to know you. We love the kind of work that you do. We're very, very interested in hiring young philosophers like you to help build the next generation of our department. Uh, we'd love to have you come out for a fly out for a, the big interview. Yeah. And so Notre Dame was the very first interview I did. It was that fall. It was lit. I still vividly remember sitting in my office in New Jersey, getting that uh, phone call and just thinking, I cannot believe this is real life. Like, I cannot believe this is happening. Um, and came out, did my talk, met everybody, spent more time with the department, got the offer. It was the first job I was ever offered. And I accepted it about a week later. And here I am 13 years later. Amazing. So this is your first and only your job as a faculty member. But yeah. But um, what a great foresight on Notre Dame's part to be able to attract you here because you've gone on to become 
you know, one of the leading scholars in the profession, and I know uh, uh, much sought after at many of the top schools uh, across the world. But tell us a little bit about your upbringing. You grew up in a really wealthy, power elite <laughs> family. Is that accurate? No, I'm nervous my mom is going to watch this. <laughs> uh, I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, and my mom is a receptionist in dental office. She actually just retired. So oh. now she's full-time grandma uh, to my little niece. Uh, and my dad just has worked a bunch of different kinds of jobs. But we were like lower middle class, the kind of family that makes it paycheck to paycheck. Very, very close, like emotionally right. very close. Today's my brother's birthday. And uh, we got like 100 text messages today. Love it. Very emotionally close, but not a family that had any experience with um with higher education not a family of people with phds and but a wonderfully tight family oh absolutely yeah. and that's you know people uh watching this know that's what it really takes that's right i will say that when i called my parents my second year of college i called them right before easter and i made two big announcements the first one was that i was converting to catholicism which was a decision that i made while i was a college student and the second big announcement was that I was no longer going to go to law school. I was going to become a professional philosopher. And I'll have to say, I think that was their low point when they had the biggest doubts about college, college education. Um, but they've always been tremendously supportive. And, and I'll say when I came to Notre Dame, my everybody in my family is a huge football fan and they immediately drank the the blue and gold kool-aid and yeah, now they're it. just the most biggest raving notre dame fans ever well that was going to be the question i was going to lead to for somebody that you know, grew up in kind of a lower middle class family you don't think about those folks necessarily going into philosophy so yeah. so and then when you add that to the conversion to catholicism tell us a little bit more about those choices in your life and how you came to them Yes, yeah, so this will I'll show my age. My very first year of college was when the September 11th attacks occurred. Oh, okay. So I was I was at UVA. I was about two weeks into my first semester of college, and it's kind of like the pandemic is for the current students that we're teaching. You didn't see this big world change coming, and then once it happens, it's really what everybody talks about. It shapes every aspect of your experience. That's what 9/11 felt like for my generation. Right. And I remember I just got into college. I didn't know anybody who lived in New York City. I'd never been to New York City. Didn't know anybody in Washington, D.C. But was suddenly waking up to, oh, my gosh, this is a complex, violent world where sometimes you can do everything right. You can be a lawyer that shows up that right. day uh, to your office in the World Trade Center. And at the drop of the hat, the world can change. And I remember thinking about that quite a bit as a college student. I was also growing up. I was becoming more mature. I was th asking some pretty hard questions about what I thought a good life would be for someone like me. And that led me to thinking seriously about faith. I mean, long story short, the first time that, uh, that I attended church, at least as an adult, making a free decision was the first anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. <sighs> and I remember I was reading the newspaper. We had to read the New York Times every day for one of my government classes. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times did a story about children who had lost both parents in the World Trade Center. And I remember at the time thinking, I want to stay like express that I stand for a world where this kind of injustice is like mourned and resisted. Um, I didn't, I didn't know I was a philosophy major yet at that point, but right. I remember thinking like, what do I stand for in this kind of world and how do I show that? And there had been a Catholic church right near the dorm where I was an RA and I'd been kind of eyeballing it for a couple months before yeah. that. I was like, what do they do in there? <laughs> What's going on in there? And on the anniversary of 9-11, uh, I thought, I want to go be in this holy place today, and I want to hear what they have to say about this world that we live in. And that was as, as far as I'd gotten. Uh, so I looked up the mass times, and they had an afternoon mass, and I went there expecting it to be a packed house where there were like soaring speeches about terrorism and the problem of evil. And instead, I showed up at that service. And there was a priest, a Dominican priest, yeah. and four old ladies, <laughs> and me. And it was your just totally normal Wednesday afternoon, weekday mass. And I remember sitting in the back, 
and not really understanding anything that was going on. I knew enough not to eat anything, (laughs) but also realizing, oh, like this is what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for big soaring speeches, but uh, very much felt like God's presence in that place and looked around at those women and thought, they're tuned in to the frequency that I am searching for. Like my antenna had been up and just scanning. And so started going back. I went back every Wednesday, you know, the scene of the crime right. where I had this, that feeling of peace and this feeling of like, oh, this is what I'm called to. And you go, you show up a couple of Wednesdays and you're a 19 year old. Eventually the Dominicans notice. <laughs> right. They come alongside and they're like, you know, is there something you want to talk about? Is there anything going on? And I, I talked to them about what I just shared with you. And the Dominicans are like, well, if you like Wednesday, you're going to love Sunday. <laughs> like you should wait. That's that's our much bigger day. Started attending Sundays and then I did the RCIA program my junior year of college. And I came into the church and the Easter vigil my junior year. No, that's really beautiful. That's yeah. powerful. And and to think that this was all born of, of you trying to make sense of 9-11 and uh the, the evil and, and, and iniquities of, of this world. Uh, how about philosophy? Did, did that just flow from Catholicism, the call to Catholicism, or how did that come about? It's funny because until until I was well into graduate school, I very much kept my faith life away from my philosophy life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was because I didn't come into the church because I read a bunch of church council documents or because I read like all of Thomas Aquinas and realized it was true. I wish that that had been the route that I came in, but it was very personal and very emotional for me joining the Catholic faith. Whereas in philosophy, especially when I was young, when I was a college student, I very much cared about looking smart and having the right answers. And I worried if I got some hard faith questions, I wouldn't be able to answer them. For philosophy, you know, in, in my high school, one of my friend's fathers was a philosophy professor. So I actually knew a philosophy professor when I was living in Greensboro. And I remember as a high school student being so judgmental and thinking, what is his job? I can't even figure out why that's a real job. Yeah. I owe him an apology, I think. <laughs> I got to college and I was pre-law, dead set on becoming a lawyer. In my very first semester of college, like all freshmen, I just got put into classes by my advisor. My advisor met with me and said, like, Megan, you're going to take this issues of life and death moral philosophy class. And I think you're going to love it. And I was like, philosophy, I don't have time for this. Right. Get ready for law school. Stuck me in this class. And sure enough, it was a great advisor. And I loved this philosophy class. The professor is a woman named Cora Diamond. It's a big, like, 200-person lecture class. But she would assign us these essay questions that were unlike any other assignment I got at EVA. I remember the very first essay we had to write is, is it ever morally permissible for someone to end their lives? And I remember going to my TA when she gave us, she gave me that assignment. I was like, are we allowed? Are we allowed to write about this? Um, And he was like, yeah, you have to write about it. That's what the the assignment is. And I was like, well, what's the answer? You know, what what book do you want me to to like summarize for you? He's like, we don't want you to summarize any book. We want you to just reason out an answer, think about the objections and go through the debate and then show us really clearly like how you're reasoning about this big question. And I found it to be very, very difficult and completely exhilarating. And the other assignments in the class were all like that, very direct, asking you to think really hard about a question that you didn't even know you had the courage to ask. And so after that class, I decided, and the philosophy majors in Notre Dame were like this, like, I'm going to do this as my fun major. Like, I'm going to have my real major, (laughs) which is going to be government. But then philosophy will be this thing that I do for fun. And I kept down that path for two more years. And then I did a, a law internship between my second and third year of college. And uh, the internship looked great on paper. It was studying vigilante violence. Yeah. I got done with the internship and I hated it. (laughs) I just, it sounded so cool, but I just was not enjoying it. I go in every day to this job and I think like, oh, I just can't wait to go home and read novels and philosophy books. And I remember getting back and I used to babysit for one of my philosophy professors in college. I went, I went, uh, I got back from that summer internship and I was coming back from a babysitting trip. And my professor asked me, Megan, like, how are things going? How was your summer? And I was like, oh, professor, I'm so sad. I got to be a lawyer after college. And I realized that I don't really like it that much, but I've already made this decision. I've got to go through with it. And he looked at me and he's like, who told you you had to be a lawyer after college? Have you thought about if you like philosophy so much, maybe you should just 
keep at it. He's like, it can be a job. He's like pointed to himself. He's like, this could be your job. (laughs) And the light went off in my mind of just like, oh my gosh, this is where my heart, this is where my deepest calling is. Yes. And then there was no turning back. So you had some incredible guides, some great mentors along the way. And um, it opened up kind of possibilities that you had never imagined before. Um, Why, why are we here? You chose this space. This space is uh, um, a space Father Ted now has passed away nine years ago, yeah. and uh, and and you chose this. Why? Tell us why. Uh, I didn't even have to think. I was worried that maybe some of the other Forget episodes have been up here, but it yeah. turns out I'm the first. Yeah. I only got to overlap with Father Ted a few years, four years, when I arrived in Notre Dame and when he passed away. But when you think about somebody from the last century who has had just a tremendous impact for good, not just on his own university, but on just colleges and universities everywhere. I mean, Father Ted has become a real hero of mine. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've read uh, many of the speeches. You can't say you've read all of them because as you see, there's a lot of content. But many of his speeches, especially from the 50s and 60s, and you realize this man was a visionary. Mm-hmm. He looked at a university that physically, intellectually looked very, very different from what Notre Dame looks like right now. Right. And he saw what it could be. <laughs> One moment for me that really resonates with Father Ted's legacy. A couple of years ago, uh, the Office of Research took the senior staff of which I was on out to Land Lakes for a retreat. So we went up to northern Wisconsin and got to stay up there for a few days. And the very first day when we arrived, we walked back in the summer cabin, uh, which is where in July, 1959, Father Ted took the other members of the Civil Rights Commission when they couldn't couldn't find anywhere else in the country where they were able to meet in peace to think about what the Civil Rights Act should look like. And so he flew out to the summer cabin, Notre Dame, Land O'Lakes, And it was blazing hot, full of mosquitoes and black flies. But those guys sat down at this humble wooden table that's still out behind that cabin. And they hashed out what would become the basis of the Civil Rights Act for our country. And you think about you think about Father Ted being a Catholic leader, a leader who was deeply motivated by his faith. And he was also an intellectual leader, a college president who was able to bring our country together to solve a really, really diff- difficult problem, to do it in a way that shows humility and shows equality, like around a wooden table in the middle of Wisconsin. I think that is a person who's a true visionary. Uh, and you you know, you know, can see the fruits of that and just what Notre Dame has become. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and I, I feel his presence still on this campus every day. And I, I, what I love about Father Ted is that he never allowed his role as university president to constrain him in any way from going out and having an impact on the major global issues of the day, whether it's staving off hunger in Laos and Cambodia, or whether it's leading the Civil Rights Commission, or wherever there was an injustice to be righted, he took Notre Dame and put us on the front line. So, very few university presidents, especially in these times, are able to do something like that. How does Father Ted and his legacy inform the work that you do as a philosopher and the leader of, of this new ethics initiative at Notre Dame? You know, I was teaching my God in the Good Life class this morning, and we just started our unit on work and the good Was life. my son there? Did he Your show? Your son was there. He was ready. He's got, he's got a big quiz coming on Wednesday. Okay, he's ready. Okay, okay, hope so. <laughs> But we're talking with all the Notre Dame freshmen about like, how how do you, how do you discern your vocation, which sounds easier than it is. And actually a lot of philosophers have tried to offer young people advice on how to do this. I bring this up because as a philosopher, I have my sense of what I'm called to do in the world and what drives me and has really been a dream come true about my career at Notre Dame so far is this idea that I, ideas can shape the cultures and the times in which we live, for right. better or for worse. Right. And done well, the Catholic world, the Catholic voice, Catholic philosophy can have this tremendously positive impact on people who are trying to imagine a future when there's a lot of change happening. Yeah. So going back to Father Ted in the 50s and the 60s, why I think this is such an interesting period 
1945, a bunch of people went to bed one day in a world that didn't have nuclear weapons. And they woke up the next day in a world where they realized, oh my gosh, some of the major countries on planet Earth now have the ability to destroy every living thing. I mean, it was just overnight. That that social change happened yeah. overnight. And in philosophy, that was a watershed moment. You saw philosophers working on all kinds of random topics before World yeah. War II. And then in 1945, suddenly every philosopher is thinking, what does it mean for us to live meaningful, ethical lives in a world where these weapons exist? Yeah. And the Catholic voice was incredibly important in that period. Faculty members at Notre Dame, Catholic thinkers were, uh, were they really stepped up to think yeah. we've got to marry this, like, you know, thousands of years of tradition of ethical thought to this brand new technology and this new world order that we couldn't have anticipated. Yeah. And we've got to counsel not only leaders like Kennedy, yeah. uh, who was navigating the Cuban Missile Crisis right. and trying to figure out how to stop nuclear war, but also educate generations of young people who are now going to have to navigate living in this kind of, uh, this kind of scenario. When I think of Father Ted and I think of Notre Dame's legacy, I think of Notre Dame as really being the standard bearer for taking the deepest ethical insights of the Catholic faith and making sure, one, that they're transmitted to future generations who are going to have to deal with really, really significant problems. Mm -hmm. And two, for making sure that the world understands that these insights and this this ethical voice is going to be present when we face those debates. Um, and, and for better or for worse, the way the world is shaping up right now, institutions like Notre Dame have have an outsized share of the responsibility of making sure that that those ideas are alive. Yeah. So I have one more question about philosophy, if yeah. I could, before we move forward. And how do you? It's very personal. How do you philosophize? <laughs> so, you know, I, I know that, you know, Aristotle's view was to, you know, peripatetic, right? That he would walk in the marketplace and he would think, and I know there's some philosophers here who don't drive, that they just walk all over the city and they do their thinking as they're moving. Um, others might sit in a, a barca lounger, and I, you know, and, and sit back there. I could just think if I were a philosopher and, and I sat in the chair silently while my wife was were, was doing everything around the house, it, the marriage wouldn't last really long. No. If I told her, I'm just philosophizing right yeah. now, I'd be in big trouble. So how personally, because it isn't just about reading and writing, you've got to take time and space to think and to think through these deep issues. How do you do that? So for me personally, the 50% of a great research project is just coming up with a great question, a question that people think, I, we don't know the answer to this question yet, but we really want to know. Give us an example of some of what, what might be some of those questions, the biggest, a great question. The biggest question that's animating my work at the moment, and I get a lot of my inspiration from reading the news. Yeah. I, my, my poor students, 50% of the readings I inflict on them in class are from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, <sighs> because I just think there's so many interesting philosophical problems that are just erupting in day-to-day -day life. The problem that I've been working on really seriously for the last few years is thinking about how we understand the moral significance of the crisis at the southern border in the United States right now. And mm -hmm. in particular, how, you know, it's a genuine crisis in the sense like there are no easy answers. Right. People are fleeing political violence. They're fleeing a complete lack of opportunity in their homes, but they're coming into other people's homes, which they've cared for deeply. Their, right. str their strangers are interacting in really high levels. People are not sure what the future holds. It poses all kinds of really interesting ethical challenges, challenges that the church has thought about. Certainly right. Pope Francis has given a lot of thought to, but where there are not simple solutions. And so one of the one of the inspirations for a major project that I've been working on is the parable of the Good Samaritan. So the mm -hmm. Gospel of Luke. Jesus is doing philosophy right. with a scholar of the Jewish law. He's asking him some really tough questions about how to interpret the love commandment. And the parable of the Good Samaritan is playing out every day right now right. with men and women in Texas and Arizona who are trying to figure out how to come to the aid of somebody that they've never met before who's in crisis, either right. on one side of the border or the other side. 
I've been writing a book that's trying to develop moral philosophy to, to apply to the ways that we think about these migration crises in our own time. There was a migration crisis back in right. Jesus' time, right. and it's a migration crisis in our own time. And it's not easy answers. It's the kind of thing that needs really, really careful reasoning. It yeah. needs a real debate. So really showing what are the strongest objections? What are the possible replies? Where is the truth in this whole mess? Yeah. And hopefully, hopefully, one, you you get to a deeper understanding about what this love teaching is in our own tradition. But also, one of the things philosophy can be really good for in the long run is helping people see options that they didn't know they had before, like options for what to believe, options for how to how to get out of a crisis. Right. And, and I hope that me and the students who are working with me on that project will also be part of the the thinking that break some of these really difficult stalemates. So in a sense, you're not leading them to answers directly. What you're doing is trying to help them ask the right, the deep questions, and then to try to reason through that, um, to come up with their own views that, that they kind of resonate with their, perhaps their own calling, their own vocation. That's why God and the Good Life, the the course that you pioneered, has just caught fire. And in hundreds of students sign up for this class every year. I've had three of my my children now take the course, and and one of them was privileged to be a small group facilitator for for three years. And and students love this because you uh, are, you're using these contemporary issues that are real to them. What are some of the questions? I, I love that that. Things like I've heard over the years through my kids is that you ask them if they could take a uh, a pain pill mm -hmm. uh, and for a year have no physical or emotional pain and there will be no side effects. Do you take the pain pill or not? And, and it, that's yeah. the kind of questions you guys discuss. Add a little color to this. Why this pops for so many students. You know, they had to submit the first uh, draft of this big essay last week. And so I was so pleased today because I had students coming up to me in class just wanting to tell me about the paper that they're working yeah. on. This, this essay, we call it the philosophical apology, but it's basically this long essay where every single student in the class picks three big dilemmas facing their pursuit of the good life uh -huh. and then tries to reason through an answer. And they write the essay, but they also have to share it with their friends. We try to encourage them to share it with their parents. Right. Um, I've uh, heard nothing so far, just for the record. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, well, they just submitted their first big question. Okay, good, um, good, good. And we critique them. Yeah. We give them a hard time. We're like, this is good. lousy reasoning. <laughs> you're not You're not thinking, you're not going deep yeah. enough. Um, the, here's the real life topic we're tackling in class today. We're talking about work in the good life. And I gave my students an article about Brian Chesky, who is the CEO of Airbnb and the, one of the founding CEOs of Airbnb. All of my students wish that they were Brian Chesky. Yeah. They all think he's got an incredibly good life and he's a good leader. Yeah. But he faced a really difficult situation in March, 2020. He, until March 2020, had told everybody that works for him at Airbnb that they're part of a big Airbnb family, that he thinks of them like siblings, that they're very close. And then in March 2020, when COVID hit, the rental market just immediately bottomed out and he had to lay off something like a quarter of his workforce. And he had to go on Zoom and make this big announcement that he was firing a big chunk of his family. And it was torture. And it tortured him as a leader to have yeah. to make that decision. He never saw that coming. Right. And it also hurt a lot of his workers because they had this really strong sense of engagement and connection with their workplace and then realized the economy changed at the drop of a hat. So one of the things we have students reason about, we've been reading Aristotle, we've been reading, reading John Paul II, and we've been reading Karl Marx. Wow. And we put the students in Brian Chesky's shoes. We're like, all right, this just happened. Yes. You, you were world's best boss until a week ago. And now you have to deliver some really difficult news. Right. What's going to be your strategy? What are you going to tell your employees about the world that, uh, that they've walked into? And which philosophical ideas are you going to use to inform it? Right. And we put this... Star Trek has this idea of the Kobayashi Maru problems, the problems that like, there's no obvious solution to this problem. It's a really gnarly, difficult problem. But what we want for students in God and the good life is for these big good life problems, for them to practice reasoning about it in a safe place, a safe enough place like Notre Dame, practice yeah. expressing their values so that 10 years from now, when they are in Brian's shoes or in a similar situation, 
it's not their first rodeo. They've right. really had a chance to thoughtfully become a kind of person that's going to know how to handle that. Tell us about the Institute for Advanced Study. So we've talked a lot about your role as a member of the philosophy faculty and your course and research. Um, you've taken on this role a few years back now, the Institute for Advanced Study. What is it and what excites you about it? So the Institute for Advanced Study exists to take really big ethical problems and little e ethics here, just big problems about the good life, the good society, the kinds of problems where we genuinely don't know the answer, but we need faculty members and we need people from the community to be reasoning about the answers to those questions. The goal of the Institute for the Advanced Study for Advanced Study is to bring those people together for a sustained year to think and talk with each other about how to make progress on these big gnarly issues. So practically what we do is we give faculty members and artists and business leaders and politicians year long fellowships to come to the University of Notre Dame around a common ethical theory, ethical problem, and to work on their big ideas. So to work on their big books, work on designing their big project. In some cases they work on really big courses that they're gonna teach. Yeah. And to meet weekly in a pretty intensive research seminar where they share their ideas and to do big events for our campus community on the issues with the idea of taking a big step forward on uh, on a topic that we care about. But so how many in a cohort roughly each year? We will have probably between 12 and 15 Professors, it's always a combination of professors, but we typically find major business leaders or politicians to join the group, sometimes big community leaders. Give us so, an example of some of the people that you've had and their backgrounds. Sure. So, you know, in 2020, we picked our, that was the first year we did one of these really theme focused yeah. uh, years and we picked the nature of trust. <laughs> and we said, we really want to make progress this year on understanding why there's a crisis of trust in democracy and a crisis of trust in the church. So those two issues, we really want to just get an understanding of this because those are two very, very important institutions. And so we brought in political scientists. We brought in social psychologists. We brought in the secretary of transportation. Mm -hmm. We brought in a very famous science fiction writer who uh -huh. just tries to imagine all the different ways society might change as a result of new technology. And we brought them to campus alongside a group of Notre Dame doctoral students and a group of Notre Dame undergraduate students that were passionate about the topic. And we sponsored their projects for a year. And our only requirement is that they do the work at Notre Dame, that they meet weekly for this, you know, pretty intensive Tuesday research seminar, and that they do events for our community to increase Notre Dame's understanding and appreciation of these issues. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic program and, and one that is still taking off. I think you have big visions for where it can go. So on top of this is more than a full plate. Between being a, you know, philosophy faculty member and star at that, and at the same time leading the Institute for Advanced Study, you take on this role uh, at the uh, behest of, of our provost and president to be the head of, through the strategic framework, one of the big new initiatives, in high impact interdisciplinary initiative that is ethics. Tell us about that. What does it mean and, and what will your responsibilities be in this new capacity? Well, I'll say, you know, we, we've been talking about being up at Father Ted's office. Another thing I find very inspiring about Father Ted is he had no conception of work-life balance. <laughs> <laughs> like if, if he really, you know, yeah. really had something that he was excited about, really saw the vision, he grabbed onto it with both hands. Right. And that's certainly what I felt like in the last year or two around Notre Dame is, is a period of uh, lots of change. Lots of really wonderful vision. And I would say we're uh, uh, me and the people that I have the pr privilege of working with are probably on Father Ted's sleep schedule these days. Yeah. Um, but it's just because we're so excited about where the opportunity is. So the ethics initiative, ethics was one of the three priorities that got named this year out of the gate as a guiding idea behind Notre Dame's planning for the next 10 years. And I am so grateful to Father John and to John McGreevy and the leaders and the board at Notre Dame for casting a really bold vision of where we want to go. I mean, 10 years, that's going to be the next phase of my career. Next 20 years will probably be the rest of my career at Notre yeah. Dame. So it's like looking at a crystal ball and seeing 
all right, if we roll up our sleeves and really get after it, this is where we could get to. For the ethics initiative, the goal is to combine our personnel, our incredible faculty, the wonderful students that we have in Notre Dame with resources that we'll hopefully get from the For Good campaign and with the vision that has animated Notre Dame since its founding to make sure that in this century, Notre Dame is among the very premier places on planet Earth to study ethics, mm -hmm. to research difficult ethical questions and to teach ethics. Yeah. And so with the ethics initiative, we are really working with faculty, with administrative leaders, with people across campus and Notre Dame's broader network of friends and supporters to think, all right, here are the steps that we need to take to get from where we currently are, which is a wonderful university with this deep and rich legacy of Catholic ethical thought to a university that is going to be the standard bearer where anybody, anybody, regardless of their religious mm -hmm. affiliation, would want to come to really dig into serious ethical questions. So in the field of ethics, you want Notre Dame to become thought leaders, value leaders, and action leaders. But ethics is so big. I yeah. mean, when you think about medical ethics, business ethics, tech ethics, uh, virtue ethics, are you going to try to take on the whole enchilada or are, are, is it going to begin with a focus? Where, where are you going with this? I mean, a good strategy, you've got to be able to say what you're doing and then what's a great idea, but you're not doing it. Otherwise, yeah. you don't have a strategy. You right. just have a, well, my students would call it a vibe. Yeah. <laughs> and over the last year, yeah. we have definitely been zeroing in on a strategy rather than a general vibe. So with ethics, there are two pieces to the puzzle when you think of ethics as a field that a university invests in. One piece is foundational ethics, the really big eternal questions. Yeah. What is a just society? Yeah. What is a good life? What is human flourishing? These are the questions that Jesus is asking, Socrates is asking, Confucius is asking, and people are still asking in the 21st century. The, these questions are dominated by philosophy and by theology, two departments that are world class already at Notre Dame, but that we want to ensure continue to be just absolutely excellent. When we think about foundational ethics, that first piece of the puzzle, Notre Dame is interested in lots of different ethical frameworks. But at the end of the day, the framework that we most care about nurturing and developing and continuing on into coming centuries is virtue ethics and the Catholic intellectual tradition. So we're going to make sure that no matter which way Princeton or Harvard or Oxford goes in philosophy, we are going to make sure that this tradition is alive and thriving at Notre Dame. And that Notre Dame really is, yeah, I, I tell Father John sometimes, we send up the bat signal. If this is your tradition, get to South Bend because yeah. this is where the work is going to be happening. Now, the second piece of the puzzle is applied ethics. These are the ethical issues that pop up right. every year and that need a response, that leaders need a way to reason through where the stakes are really high. And we can't always predict what they're going to be, but we can hope that we build a robust enough research culture at Notre Dame so that when the big issues happen, like the development of nuclear weapons, we well, are more recently ready. artificial intelligence and, and new technologies. Absolutely. That's something that you're focusing on as well. Absolutely. So again, on the strategy piece for applied ethics at Notre Dame. We're already strong in bioethics and medical ethics, and the Catholic Church has taken uh, has taken a deep investment in thinking about questions at the beginning and end of human life. We got to keep that strand going, but we've got to add to it. And in particular, we there are generations of Notre Dame students that are already the first ones already here on our campus who want to be educated about artificial intelligence right. and its economic implications and its personal implications and how church teaching is going to develop in an economy that's dominated by artificial intelligence, the environmental crisis. So Pope Francis has this really beautiful encyclical, Laudato Si, that just basically says the Catholic world is now going to be thinking about the environment and people's homes and what homes mean to them. Right. But the Pope has said we're going to do this work. Now Notre Dame has to roll up its sleeves and actually start writing those books, making those classes on Catholic environmental ethics and investigating these questions. So technology, environment, the third one that we have to add to the mix, which ties a bunch of other questions together, is business and organizational ethics. 
So what does it mean to be Brian Chesky, yes. to be the president of the United States, to lead a branch of the military in a world of this level of complexity and this level of moral and political disagreement? We want Notre Dame to be taking on those questions and to also be a refuge for leaders who are seeing an ethical problem for the first time and know that they need to get it right. Well, I got to tell you that it, you sometimes I think many people think about philosophy. They think about something that is so esoteric and ethereal. And, you know, you're reading books like Kant and Hegel and you're trying to just understand the page that you've just read. And, and what you've done is you've made this real for our students. And I think real for all of our viewers about how do we use foundational ethics to apply how we address the the most challenging problems of the day and and you make it come alive and you've done a brilliant job at that we are so blessed uh to have you here at notre dame leading this initiative and really excited about how you're touching the lives of our students and how this is going to be multiplied uh to impact society in in ways that we can't even begin to imagine right now so thank you so much megan and thanks for being with us today um, as we always do with this program, uh, this is a uh, a university dedicated to Our Lady. So we're going to close with, with a prayer to Mary. Please join us from wherever you're coming from. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us. Take care. God bless. Go Irish. Thanks again, Megan. Yeah, thanks, Lou.